Why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? If you develop games, make films, write books, or create any other form of art, it can be a lot of fun to take inspiration from our favorite works. Appreciating the impact they had, their nuances, and diving into their deeper meanings can pay tremendous dividends as you create something you can call your own. However, I feel it is equally or more important to learn from the mistakes your favorite works made. By considering what could have been, you open doors to creating something distinct from your inspirations, perhaps even surpassing them in the process. When it comes to video games, sequels and spiritual successors are usually the best place to put these lessons to the test. But when it comes to remakes, things get trickier. When you're rebuilding a beloved game, plenty of questions need to be asked. Which changes would face backlash and which would be lovingly accepted? Would incorporating certain elements from a more modern perspective be considered untrue to the spirit of the original? No matter what you do, a remake isn't always going to please everyone. And that's what makes it such a delicate topic. Valve, in particular, doesn't like to look back. They take what they learn from previous projects and apply those lessons to entirely new ones. But doing this led to them not releasing a proper video game until 2020. During the 2010s, their lack of communication and inability to get projects off the ground made it seem as though the company had devoted all of their attention to the things that made them money. But the truth is, there were people trying to develop games within Valve. Though Half-Life Alex would eventually release, those years of silence were rough. In the end, we love Half-Life, and we just wanted to have that experience again. Due to Half-Life's seamless method of storytelling and groundbreaking game design, it has had a monumental impact on its players, and the fans continue to carry the series' legacy through videos, art, discussion, and mods. And one of those mods, which later became a full game, officially sanctioned by Valve, remains prolific in the history of Half-Life, video game modding, and remakes in general. Spawning from a distaste for Valve's Source Engine port of Half-Life, Black Mesa is a remake of Half-Life from the ground up. Details have been added to connect it to the greater Half-Life universe, as well as enhance its thematic strengths. Certain levels have been completely overhauled, while others have been either subtly adjusted or just left alone where appropriate. Aspects of Half-Life 2 have been implemented to create cohesion between the game and the rest of the franchise's outings on the Source engine. It is both a faithful adaptation of Valve's original work, and something totally distinct in its own right. And it took just as long to come out as an official installment from Valve coincidentally releasing alongside Valve's first official Half-Life installment in over 12 years. Black Mesa is an incredible game, one that stands shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the Half-Life series. I've been meaning to make this video since the game was finished, and to those of you that waited patiently for me to talk about it, thank you so much. After so many sequels deviated from the original game's setting, it's refreshing to return to the resonance cascade that started it all. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is a Black Mesa Retrospective. Before we dive into the meat of this video, I want to quickly revisit the original Half-Life and amend some previous statements made in my Half-Life Retrospective, as well as reflect on things. I mean, it's been four years since I originally released that video, and I've learned and grown a lot since then. Most of you know why Half-Life is such a legendary game by now anyway, so I won't reiterate any of that here. In keeping with the theme of this video, I want to first address the things I got wrong, as well as the things I disagree with now. For one thing, my breakdown of the weapons of Half-Life was messy. I talked about there being no reason to go back to the pistol once you've obtained other close-range and high-accuracy weapons, but that's just flat-out wrong. The pistol doesn't get any less accurate, it is still one of the most accurate weapons in the game provided you are left-clicking to shoot, and it remains highly effective at taking out enemies from a distance. It may not have the power, but it's essentially a handheld sniper rifle when used right. If anything, I find it more reliable at a distance than even the revolver due to its quicker reload times and lack of heavy recoil. On top of that, the SMG can be pretty accurate in short bursts if need be. I think my misguided critiques of the weapons in Half-Life stem from my preference for a smaller but more focused weapon selection in shooters. The game's sequel scaled back the amount of wacky weapons you could play with in order to place more focus on the gravity gun and more utility on the few weapons it kept in. I still love that approach, but it's not like the amount of weapons in Half-Life 1 affected game balance at all, 
And just because I didn't find many applications for the trip mine, Snarks, and Hive Hand at the time, doesn't mean others won't. Maybe my experience with Tears of the Kingdom changed my mind as you can solve problems in one of many seemingly endless ways in that game. But I have since found plenty of ways to experiment with every weapon in Half-Life. That's the thing about both Half-Life and its sequel. Despite the differences in weapon selection, both games fostered experimentation. In the first game it was thanks to its diverse and wacky plethora of weapons, while in the sequel it was thanks to the gravity gun putting the physics engine in the player's hands. Both games have their merits. The other thing I wanted to expand upon were my thoughts on Zen. Yes, I still enjoy what exists of Zen in the final game to an extent, but they are hardly full chapters of Half-Life. Though the team always intended on sending the player to an alien world, Zen and its final boss the Nihilanth were conceived very late in development, and the maps that exist in the final game are pretty much just whatever Valve had finished before the game's deadline. The first chapter is basically just a few floating platforms that lead you down to a room with a single puzzle if you can even call it a puzzle, I mean you're just pressing E three times. The Gonark chapter is home to a single boss fight that drags you through a few areas, and on my most recent playthrough, the final phase of the boss completely bugged out. It would force me into the pit and not follow me down. Therefore I had to blow a hole in the ground myself and escape. I guess in the canon of that playthrough, the Gonark is still alive. Canon event disrupted. Interloper is probably the most complete chapter of Zen, though I use that term lightly. It mostly features a bunch of annoying vertical platforming and combat before you are finally teleported to the fight with the Nihilanth. I may enjoy the build-up and payoff of finally seeing Zen before the game ends, as well as certain aspects of its design, but in truth, it was pretty blatantly unfinished. Other than that, I think most of what I said is still accurate to my feelings today. I still don't really enjoy navigating the chapter on a rail and I try to abandon the car wherever I can but I definitely stand by the game's otherwise phenomenal game design. There just aren't many games like Half-Life out there anymore. First-person shooters that blend intuitive problem-solving with exploration, horror, intense combat, and a uniquely desolate atmosphere. Storytelling that shows more than it tells, asking your imagination to fill in the blanks based on Valve's trademark attention to detail. It feels like there are still lessons to be learned from Half-Life, particularly in the value of crafting a detailed, linear game that is fun to replay and experiment with. And these are lessons that Black Mesa took to heart. As mentioned, Black Mesa began life after the release of Half-Life Source in 2004. Perhaps it was unfair to expect this simple port to feature overhauled graphics that stands shoulder to shoulder with the sequel, but I do think it was fair to expect a competent version of the game. And Half-Life Source was barely that. Its new reflections make metal surfaces look as though they'd all been recently polished, destroying the atmosphere and effect of certain scenes, areas, and models, the new water doesn't mesh well with the original art style, and certain scripts that worked properly in the original game are destroyed by bugs, sometimes ruining critical scenes, like when you're introduced to the military's true objective of silencing the science team. The game is filled with bugs, some entertaining, some annoying. It's not an ideal way to experience Half-Life by any means, and I suggest you check out Pat Bite's video on the game's bugs if you want to learn more. Only a few months after Half-Life Source was released and leading up to the eventual release of Half-Life 2, two teams of modders consolidated their efforts into a project called Black Mesa Source, which aimed to faithfully recreate Half-Life in the Source engine, taking full advantage of the engine's capabilities and recreating everything from scratch. A small team taking on such an ambitious project, with years of that work being not-for-profit, would eventually result in the game's nearly 16-year-long development cycle. In that time, they acquired a license for the Source engine from Valve and became a retail product in 2012, later finishing the Zen levels in 2019. Black Mesa's development was a significant part of the team's lives for a long time, and in the end, most of them had other jobs while contributing to the project. The game's development is an inspiring tale of ambition and dedication, and they managed to create something worthy of being called a Half-Life game. I'm going to walk through this game chapter by chapter, talking about the faithfulness to the original game, noteworthy changes that I appreciate, and the game's adherence to Valve's game design philosophies when creating entirely new level design and mechanics. And where else to begin? Than the train ride that started it all. This scene is so imperative to video game history that I hesitate to even summarize it here. You get a glimpse into the world you're about to inhabit, 
observing the various sections of the facility that subtly clue you into both narrative and design elements. What completes it, however, is Kelly Bailey's ambient masterpiece known as Vague Voices. Aptly named, bits and pieces of the instrumentation foreshadow the disaster to come. But it's so, well, vague that it feels welcoming. It works in tandem with the train sequence to create intrigue, but it is also a much needed calm before the storm. Black Mesa's train ride is a little bit different atmospherically, both in an effort to flesh out the setting and to differentiate itself from the original game. Original set pieces have been faithfully recreated, but also expanded upon. For example, your final clue on the train ride that something is amiss at the facility is a crack in a silo of toxic waste, which spills into a pit below. In Black Mesa, this clue is more prevalent with a blaring siren and slightly panicked scientists attempting to regain control of the situation. The facility is also far more lively in Black Mesa, as we get glimpses into the dormitories and break areas, and fellow scientists wave a friendly hello to Gordon as he passes by. You'd think that the accompanying music piece would be similarly friendly, but it instead serves as a stark contrast to the train ride's atmosphere. It accomplishes a similar goal of implying imminent danger, but it is far more outward in conveying this feeling. Joel Nielsen composed the score for Black Mesa, and rather than trying to merely emulate Kelly Bailey's score for Half-Life, he instead creating something wholly unique, and it is used to great effect. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Much like the original game, this chapter allows you to experience and appreciate life before the Resonance Cascade, but the team expanded upon the conversations you can have with fellow scientists and security guards. At this point, most of us know that something bad is going to happen, so they allow you to relish the time before that happens. My favorite interactions are the guy who wants a vacation from pushing buttons, a nod to the fact that Gordon Freeman has a PhD, and all he does at Black Mesa is push a cart. That MIT education really pays for itself. Also, when you blow up Magnuson's casserole, the guard has like a thousand one-liners. You better make like diarrhea and run. You better make like a bread truck and haul buns. You better make like a prom dress and take off. You better make like a nut and bolt. There's also a brief mention of Gordon's elusive ponytail. Aw oh, man, you cut the ponytail. Sell out. The ponytail on Gordon's model in Half-Life was a remnant of early development, but it was so prominent in Gold Source that I'm glad they referenced it in some capacity here. Speaking of Magnuson, They've made more of an effort to link this game with Half-Life 2 and its episodes continuity-wise, with mentions of Barney Calhoun, and Eli Vance and Dr. Kleiner make appearances, with dialogue faithful to their characters. Kleiner even takes a liking to a headcrab when he spots it nearby, establishing his fondness for the creatures before he would keep one as a pet, and cause the events of Half-Life 2. The test chamber this time around is far more sinister with its dark lighting and ambient sounds, which I appreciate. It still retains the bright colors of the original game, but the only things that end up illuminating the chamber are the lights that flash as the Resonance Cascade takes place. Upon awakening from the Resonance Cascade in the original Half-Life, you'd hear the track Space Ocean, which instilled a sense of emptiness and loneliness as everything fell apart. In Black Mesa, it's something more. It evokes emotions of the far-reaching consequences of the incident, this isn't just a catastrophic event for the facility, the world as we know it is on its way out, and things are about to get much, much worse. Space Ocean had its place in the original game, but for those of us with knowledge of the larger Half-Life series, Black Mesa's track Resonance is one of the most haunting and emotional the series has ever seen. The original Half-Life is well known for its survival horror elements, elements that would later be gradually stripped away from the series. I wouldn't say they disappeared altogether by any means, though. Raven Home, the parking garage in Episode 1, and the Antlion Caves in Episode 2 can all be pretty terrifying. Black Mesa is often much scarier than even the original Half-Life. To begin with, you don't get your crowbar until after you meet the security guard here. You have to either guide his bullets towards the zombies, or throw flares at the zombies and watch them burn to death, while dodging them through the hallways. The atmosphere of survival horror continues into the chapter Office Complex. Introduced with a dire piece of music, the chapter features darker lighting, limited visibility, and limited room to move. It might not seem like much, but coupled with the chapter's maze-like level design, this adds so much to the atmosphere and gameplay. 
At one point, you can save a guard from being killed, and from there you'll have access to a small armory and a friend to follow you around and back you up in these dark halls. There's an added emergency broadcast in one of the lounge areas, which lets people know to evacuate New Mexico within a certain radius of the facility. It gives you a glimpse into the outside ramifications of the Resonance Cascade, something that remains ambiguous a lot of the time throughout the original game and Black Mesa. And that ambiguity is what makes this facility such a brilliant setting for a video game. Another chapter heightened by these elements is Power Up. The chapter has barely any light other than the flashlight from your suit. By this point, the military has invaded the facility, so you're trying to establish a method of killing this giant alien whilst dodging Vortigaunts, Hound Eyes, and soldiers in dark, claustrophobic corridors. Once the lights come back on, you're confronted with an onslaught of soldiers in those same corridors. Black Mesa makes its objective to keep the player guessing. Rather than adhering too closely to the original game, it tweaks and reinvents several chapters when it feels it needs to, without those changes feeling like mere gimmicks. A lot of it becomes subconsciously embedded into how you explore and solve problems, much like any of the games in the Half-Life series. For example, early on the game teaches you that you need to find a red valve in order to proceed. This becomes a recurring theme for a while, but it's not meant to just keep you looking for valves. It's more so implemented for you to recognize when you have a piece missing. In Office Complex, rather than simply crawling through a vent and over the moving platform, you now have to attach a valve in order to move the platform yourself. Several puzzles have been fleshed out in this manner. In Black Mesa's version of On a Rail, you'll encounter a room filled with electrified water, and you'll need to search for a method of turning that water off before diving in and discovering a loose cable that powers the bridge. At the beginning of Apprehension, when you're stuck in the water with no way of getting across, instead of just shooting a lock and letting the bridge float up, you have to instead hunt for barrels that float upward so that the bridge can be lifted, an idea ripped straight from Half-Life 2, seamlessly integrated into the design of the original game. The physics engine is not just for show when ragdolls crumple to the ground or you throw grenades. It's embedded into many aspects of this game's design. This means you can throw objects, carry them with you, throw health packs and suit modules in a safe place for when you need to recover, or even use physics objects to skip portions of levels as you could in Half-Life 2, though obviously not to the same extent. There's no gravity gun here, and the game isn't asking you to bend the engine to your will in the same manner. After all, this is a remake of Half-Life 1, not Half-Life 2. This means that although the physics engine is there and it's seamless, it is instead used to improve on the pacing and design philosophies of Half-Life 1, while also keeping it in line with its sequels. Using the Source engine also means that they have access to all of its fidelity features, and the art direction and attention to detail in Black Mesa is staggering. In order to fit in with the Source engine, countless new and detailed textures have been created. Each wall painted with history, each room filled with detail and life. The lighting can redefine how chapters are experienced, either through a lack thereof, or in the ways in which lights bounce color off of nearby walls in Lambda Core. Though a lot of Half-Life's original level design still exists in Black Mesa, nearly all of the visuals have been carefully reconstructed to either emulate the original Half-Life's atmosphere, or create something of its own. Also, jibs are back. I felt like jibbing enemies in Half-Life 1 really sold the brutality of its setting, and there's nothing quite like getting up close and personal with your shotgun and right-clicking to turn them into chicken nuggets. The physics engine means their bits and bobs fly everywhere, complete with trails of blood as if it were some morbid fireworks display. The funny thing about using Source for so long, despite there being much better options these days, is that it feels charming and authentic. The team pushed this engine to its limits based on what they had to work with, and the Havoc physics engine has always had its quirks, but it makes Black Mesa feel right at home with the rest of the series. Those quirks, by the way, are still here in Black Mesa. Getting stuck on things, objects reacting strangely to specific circumstances, all that stuff. That being said, my hundreds of hours in Gary's Mod over the years are a testament to how much I enjoy messing with this physics engine. It is so detailed, so well implemented in the context of Half-Life 2, and yet, it is whack. Sure, casually messing around with the engine in your average playthrough of Half-Life 2 won't always produce ridiculous results like this, but my enjoyment of the utterly nonsensical happenings of this engine are a part of its everlasting charm. The Black Mesa team stuck with the Source engine through thick and thin. In my Half-Life retrospective, I said that the Source engine was easy to work with, and that may have been true when it was in its prime, 
but that is not really the case anymore. Despite how antiquated it had become in the face of other engines, and despite the name change, Black Mesa would not be Black Mesa without the Source. And this extends beyond how charming the engine's faults are. It extends to the way the game feels to play, the way it feels to look at, the way it feels to just exist in a Source Engine game has never been replicated. I think the team realized that this game could be an entry point for many into the Half-Life series, and its adherence to the Source Engine keeps it consistent and faithful to the rest of it. In terms of keeping the player guessing, let's talk about what combat and movement bring to this game. Pretty much all of the weapons are applicable in the same scenarios as the original game. There are some changes like the SMG's clip size being smaller, probably to balance out its surprising amount of accuracy, or being able to aim down sights with the revolver, but it's all largely identical in function. There are a few substantial changes to how combat functions here though. For one thing, the Source engine has much tighter controls in comparison to Gold Source, which was based on the Quake engine. The Quake engine had very slippery controls which worked well in wide open arenas, but don't exactly translate well to Half-Life's stingy platforming sections. You have some control over the speed of your movement in the original if you hold Shift or the E key, but Source's controls are much tighter and more responsive, making the platforming sections not only more bearable, but also welcome in Zen's case. The enemy AI has miraculously figured out how to do two things at once, as they can now move and shoot at the same time. This means you can no longer exploit their weakness, and combat is often more relentless than even the original game. To compensate, enemies more frequently drop health packs, and you can find means to replenish your health and suit power more often. That doesn't mean it's infinite, but it certainly helps, as the original game was much less forgiving in that regard. Your first real taste of this level of combat comes in the chapter We've Got Hostiles. It sticks pretty close to the original game's level design, which I think was wise as it was one of the most exciting turning points in Half-Life, and this chapter could stay faithful whilst introducing players to the new flow of combat. What also punctuates this combat is Joel Nielsen's score for the chapter, kicking in just as you ascend the elevator to the surface, where the military is waiting for you. For most of this chapter, you might be playing it safe to avoid gunfire, only shooting when you feel like you have a solid opening. Then, once you reach this elevator and the bass guitar kicks in, something changes, and suddenly you're an unstoppable force. The track has these electronic subtleties during its refrains, and the clashing of these elements really sells the feeling of the military descending on this place, now that everything has gone to shit. It's a good thing too that the track propels the player forward, as this section can be cleared if you decide to rush for the ladder and get in through the decimated elevator shaft. You can choose to fight here, but you can also choose to run. In this instance, I think Joel Nielsen solidified himself as not just a composer, but also an integral part of Black Mesa's game design. Further examples of his astounding impact on this game can be found in the chapter Blast Pit. These tentacles are sensitive to noise, just like the original game, and the chapter generally follows the same design as the original. There are subtle touch-ups in certain places, and those touch-ups are both faithful to the original game, and carry Black Mesa's progression and seamless puzzle design, but where this chapter shines most as an adaptation of Valve's original work is in Joel Nielsen's score. After finally restoring power to the machine, a track kicks in that instills hope. It backs up that realization that the tentacles are ready to be killed, but also, much like the track Resonance, it feels as though there is still a chance of being able to fight back against these unforeseen consequences. All that's left to do now is get back to the control room and press the fire button, which means getting past the tentacles one last time. Normally, in order to get past the tentacles, you would have to create some noise away from the direction in which you want to go, so that it doesn't immediately kill you upon stomping your loud little feetsies around. By the end of this chapter, I think both the designers of Black Mesa and Joel Nielsen might have realized that you already know how to get around this thing. You already know how to deal with it, and the only thing standing in your way is that last stretch of ladders and platforms before you can reach the control room. Knowing this, Joel composed a track that builds on the somber feeling of finally seeing this thing off, but also just completely blindsides you and asks you to run like hell.
every time I replay this chapter, I run. I throw as many grenades as I can to throw it off of my trail, and I don't stop at any point. I just keep going right until I reach the fire button, and usually, my sprint toward that button takes enough time so that the cooldown period of the song syncs up perfectly as the button is pressed and the tentacles go down in flames. This is, without a doubt, one of the most memorable moments in Black Mesa for me, and I think the melancholy audible in this song just speaks volumes to how the team considered that Zen's intelligent life was just thrust into a world that wasn't familiar to it, with language that they cannot comprehend, and now they're fighting just as hard as we are to survive as they endured unethical experiments and now violent pressure from Black Mesa, the military, and in the case of the Vortigaunts, enslavement by the Nihilanth. This moment captures all of those things through both game design and music, and it once again demonstrates how Joel has had a profound effect on the way players experience the game and its events. The utilization of music in Half-Life is fascinating to me. I made a whole video talking about the subject. I talked about how composers can have an impact on a game's design, but also how the lack of music can often emphasize how important those moments with music can feel. The silence allows you to immerse yourself, and when the time is right, music can move a player forward or tell a story, among many other things, therefore making those moments feel much more memorable. The death of the tentacles in Blast Pit is one of those incredible moments. The other thing about Black Mesa's soundtrack is that although it has the hallmarks of Kelly Bailey's work, electronic instrumentation evocative of the setting, drums, guitars, samples, Black Mesa's score is unquestionably its own thing. Black Mesa's music doesn't sound like Half-Life music, it sounds like Black Mesa music. And I mean that in the best possible way. As an aside, Joel Nielsen worked on the sound design for Black Mesa as well. Almost all of Black Mesa's sound design and voice acting is completely redone, in a manner that is faithful to the original game, and very much impactful in its own way. Headcrabs have the same sounds, but Hound Eyes now let out an unsettling high-pitched whistle as they are about to attack. Sounds much scarier than the original to me. The guns all have new sound effects, from the pop of the pistol to the violent ripping and tearing of the gluon gun, they all sound fantastic. The shotgun in particular sounds perfect. Half-Life's low, chunky sound design was already great, but Black Mesa's shotgun just has this euphoric impact when it goes off. There's nothing quite like getting up close and personal with an enemy, and then right-clicking to send their jibs flying everywhere. While I will miss some sound effects from the original game, I feel that redesigning nearly all of the sound for Black Mesa was not only essential, but it also helps sell the game's distinct atmosphere against the original game as does the soundtrack. Oh, and a random fun fact for you, for the fleshy footstep sound effects on those specific surfaces, the foley is actually created through a light, open-handed slap of a wet ass cheek, courtesy of his wife. Back to the topic of keeping the player on their toes, let's talk about one of this game's most dramatic overhauls, a chapter that Black Mesa can almost entirely call its own, save for the original ideas. As some of you might know, on a Rail is probably my least favorite chapter in the original Half-Life. Repeat playthroughs have made me come to appreciate it a little more, as you can ditch the car pretty much immediately and solve the chapter on foot if you really want to. I did get stuck in the floor a lot while doing this, but at least I have console commands to help me out. Without having to manage the car, the layout of On a Rail has become much less confusing to me, and far more enjoyable. The limited space to move due to the electrified rails still annoys me, but the chapter is a testament to how creative you can get in Half-Life, despite how linear the games are. In contrast, On a Rail has been almost entirely redesigned in Black Mesa. Some parts have been maintained, like the elevator full of turrets and the ability to change directions on the rail system, but the flow of progression is far more linear, with most exploration being entirely optional if you feel you need to scavenge for resources, where you will often be met with confrontation. There are also completely redesigned combat encounters that bridge together parts of the rail system, the game pauses to build on concepts like with the electrified water, and you also have to prepare the rocket for launch yourself by releasing it from containment, all the while fighting off soldiers in an enclosed space. Before you can finally launch the rocket, you can stop and listen to two soldiers talking about you just like the original game, but as soon as you engage, it quickly spirals into a full-scale battle. You alone against the military. 
The track that plays here is perfect for thrusting players into combat, but it also feels like it conveys the military's waning confidence in their mission. It's an awesome moment. On a Rail is more streamlined, engaging, and fun than its predecessor, transforming a least favorite chapter of mine into something I look forward to revisiting with every playthrough of Black Mesa. The surprises keep coming. The actual moment of apprehension in Apprehension catches me completely off guard. Although it happens in a similar room to the original game, the game doesn't take control away from you until you actually get knocked out. And it happens fast. I was just chasing after an assassin when I stumbled into that familiar room with a health charging station and I got conked over the head when trying to run back out. Though questionable ethics is largely faithful to the original game, there are two major differences. First, Nuclear Mission Jam has been replaced. There is no topping Nuclear Mission Jam, but the new track delivers the same effect. Second, rather than escorting the scientists manually to the lobby like in the original game, this time around one of the scientists feels that things were a little too easy. As soon as the doors open and you step out into the lobby, you are ambushed by a fierce onslaught of soldiers and the music kicks things up to 11. There's gunfire everywhere, there are soldiers firing from above, and more soldiers storm in from the right side. It's intense, and it's meant to feel like you barely have a moment to breathe. But it's a welcome surprise, and one of Black Mesa's best. It helps set up Gordon Freeman as this one-man army, and a hero to the Vortigaunts, and the military's feudal resistance against both the forces of Zen and Gordon Freeman continue into Surface Tension. Surface Tension is the beefiest chapter in both the original game and Black Mesa. It has its annoying aspects, but it remains a fun and important chapter of Half-Life, for its overwhelming combat and shift in tone. You are no longer trapped below the surface. You are now a major threat. Black Mesa reworked several aspects of this chapter to make it flow much better. First of all, rather than having a couple of roads before reaching the underwater section, this game pits you in an all-out war. Like other combat encounters, cover is plentiful even in the face of more relentless enemy AI, and you can find health and fight for it when you need it most. Shortly after the chapter begins, a piece of music picks up that sounds far more dire than the previous military battle themes, symbolizing their inability to defeat you and their impending loss in the fight against the aliens. This feeling continues throughout the chapter, and you can bear witness to it at several points. You fight through several soldiers before jumping the fence and hearing the guitars kick in, where I felt compelled to just go ham. There's much less guesswork in the minefields, as all of the mines are now completely visible. You still have to watch your step and avoid the headcrabs that can land on them and set them off, just as they did with the turrets and trip mines and We've Got Hostiles. The snipers are much more forgiving in their accuracy and fire rate, and you can take cover and fight back accordingly. All the while, the ideas from the original game like this arena, or the trip mine filled room, are maintained without playing out identically. Surface tension is so varied in its design, much like the original game except that it's even more varied, more refined, and much less brutal here, without feeling like any of that original design has been diluted. And after a while, you crawl through the sewers and get a chance to soak in the atmosphere of the mesas surrounding the facility. In the original Half-Life, this was the moment where what we now know as the Valve theme would play for the first time. In this game, that pipe you're crawling through forms the Black Mesa logo at the end through some perspective trickery. Which is remarkably clever in its own right, but then you crawl out and witness the majesty of this game's mesas. Picturesque and breathtaking, and accompanied by a worthy successor to Kelly Bailey's original track. Joel Nielsen has established his own style of composing for this game, but his application of music to break the silence is befitting of the rules of Half-Life's design. He struck a perfect balance, and I feel the scene where you crawl through the pipe and observe the Black Mesa logo is symbolic of how this game has shaped its own identity. It may carry a lot of Half-Life's original level design with it, but from its subtle tweaks to its full-on overhauls, its original soundtrack, and its reverence for the larger Half-Life series and its design philosophies, it has crafted an identity of its own. And it only gets better from here. By the time you reach Forget About Freeman, the military has lost the battle, and the combat themes have dwindled in confidence and determination. We've got hostiles to on a rail to surface tension, to now. They're about to pull out of the facility after facing the very creature that you're about to confront. 
and as you catch the military in combat while they retreat, another one of Joel Nielsen's best tracks fills your ears. It's simply, unambiguously, directly, straightforwardly, badass. Perhaps the best thing about Black Mesa as a remake is that the design changes it makes in its most faithful chapters are subtle enough that you don't even notice them while playing. They are there and you can dissect them if you really want to, but I feel that's not how the game was intended to be perceived. Like I could go back and pick out why unforeseen consequences and residue processing's platforming and pathfinding scenarios work better if I really wanted to, but the point is, the differences are so subtle and are done in an effort to make the already excellent design of Half-Life shine as if we were all playing it for the first time again. To me, that is the mark of a great remake. That being said, past this point, there wasn't a whole lot of Half-Life to remake, due to the Zen chapters being unfinished. As such, Crowbar Collective took their time to build Zen from the ground up, by their own terms. Zen's development took so long that at one point, it was as if Black Mesa's Zen chapters were Crowbar Collective's own Episode 3. The difference between them and Valve, however, was that they were constantly communicative, and the team consistently built on what they had to make Black Mesa the best it could be. Zen had to accomplish several things. For one thing, these chapters still needed to carry the DNA of a Half-Life game, as well as accurately represent what was in place in the original game. In addition, since it had been such a long time since Black Mesa had received any new chapters, they needed to be substantial additions to the game itself. They also couldn't feel disconnected from the rest of the game, despite their otherworldly setting. They needed to keep building on mechanics and design philosophies demonstrated throughout the entirety of their game up to this point. Essentially, with barely anything to go off of, they needed to create a Valve game themselves. They needed to think like Valve. When you awaken from your teleportation, you grab your crowbar and head for the visible horizon and bear witness to the visual spectacle that this team has crafted, conveyed by the beginnings of Joel Nielsen's meticulously crafted sound design and original score for Zen. The introductory music for Zen features a vocal motif for the first time in a Half-Life soundtrack, and I can't imagine a better utilization of vocals than the ethereal beauty of this Zen. In the original game, Zen could be beautiful, but its visual design was primarily meant to make the player feel unsettled, and this is visible in its use of off-putting greens and browns, as well as the lonely atmosphere of planetoids floating in an empty abyss. It felt dirty and grimy, and at times it looked as if the walls were decorated in flesh, it felt right at home in a shooter that was very much a survival horror game. While Black Mesa's interpretation of Zen certainly can evoke this feeling, this Zen aims to evoke a wide range of emotions. Basically, if the meaning of Zen as a prefix implies you are a stranger or foreigner to this world, Black Mesa's Zen taps into the other spelling of the word Zen, meaning peaceful or calming, like the healing pools. As mentioned previously, Zen has its own ecosystem that has been disturbed and disrupted by forces from both worlds. The Black Mesa Research Facility, and the Nihilanth. To me, it's not that the world is meant to feel inherently unsettling, it's that Zen itself has been unsettled. By starting off with such a breathtaking display, we feel welcome here. These cool combinations of purples and blues, coupled with the lack of any immediate danger, allow the player to appreciate both what Zen is, and appreciate the fact that this team of Half-Life fans have finally accomplished their goal. And I'm glad it's not just a retread of what was in place for the original Half-Life's artistic direction. Zen is packed with detail just as the Earthbound chapters were, with its wildlife, flora and fauna, meteorites and crystals all playing into the mechanics of the chapter. First of all, hopping from place to place is far easier to control thanks to the multi-directional long jump, but also because you can air strafe as you would in other Source games, making for some really dynamic movement when in combat, solving puzzles, 
or running as fast as you can from the forces that seek to destroy you. After doing some platforming and being reminded of teleporters and power cords, you are asked to step into Black Mesa's remote research station. The station lacks power, therefore you're forced to meander through this place with nothing but a flashlight. Combined with the tight corridors and the HEV suit zombies, this entire sequence is genuinely really disturbing, and it continues to establish puzzle concepts that are consistent throughout the Zen chapters. After this, you bear witness to the natural plant life in Zen, accentuated by a shift to primarily green and blue colors, and you'll find yourself running along moss-covered trees, giant leaves and lily pads that can support your weight, before all of these concepts come together as you attempt to free this tree of the growths preventing its leaves from coming out. We get a callback to the tripmine filled room in Black Mesa with these new Zen plants, and a lot of careful navigation. And once that's out of the way, you are asked to navigate through Zen's water, and come to deal with the hazards that dwell in it. Finally, you'll arrive at an area similar to the one found at the beginning of the original Half-Life Zen chapters, and it even has a three-piece puzzle inside. But rather than it just being about freeing three Zen butterflies by pressing the Use key on them, it's about creating a portal to the Gonark's lair. You'll have to solve puzzles using power conduits similar to the ones found in Episode 2, with each puzzle being harder than the last, and adding more chords and variables. Zen's first chapter is filled to the brim with detail and variety in its visual and level design, and it gives players a deeper glimpse into Zen's ecosystem than they ever had in the original game, all the while fleshing out concepts that are not only evocative of puzzles from the Earthbound chapters, but eventually come to a head in the chapter Interloper. But first, it's time for the Gonark's Lair. In the original game, the Gonark was a goofy-looking headcrab with a giant testicle swinging around beneath it. You'd shoot it, it'd run, and you'd repeat this process until it finally died. While Black Mesa follows the same general sense of progression as the original game, it fleshes out both the Gonark's behavior and the things that happen in between your scuffles with it, transforming a goofy enemy that was intended to be terrifying into something that is genuinely terrifying. Rather than chasing it down, you'll often find that it is now chasing you. Much like the original game, the colors of this chapter shift to a deep red, to emphasize the danger you're about to find yourself in. The chapter begins with you walking out into this open area and setting up a device with these three crystals, but just as it begins to power on, you hear a massive roar, and the Gonark crawls up from the ground. The fight asks you to shoot it until it retreats, just as the original game did, but the Gonark is much more accurate and aggressive this time, and it'll chase you down and send you flying with an incredible amount of force. Once it runs off, you'll be asked to progress through a series of puzzles, with the chapter being paced like any other Half-Life chapter, and having a similar amount of design cohesion to the previous chapter. But with the notion that the Gonark is still out there, and it could find you at any moment. In a manner evocative of the Antlion Caves in Episode 2, it runs after you throughout the chapter, with multiple instances of you either shooting it or running for your life and finding cover. The puzzles involving the spreading of fire keep building until eventually, you are boxed in and you have to flush the Gonark out with fire. You chase it into a final battle arena and fight it to the death. All the while, Joel's pulse-pounding score for this chapter fills your ears. The Gonark puts up a hell of a fight throughout this chapter, and it feels amazing to finally lay it to rest. Okay, so Interloper does overstay its welcome quite a bit, and it could have been cut down. Everywhere I look, that seems to be the consensus. But I still enjoy a lot of what this chapter does. In the original game, Interloper first thrust you into encounters with a few alien species, notably a Gargantua, before warping you to the inside of a tower and introducing you to a docile group of Vortigaunt workers. You'd climb all the way up the tower and you'd be teleported to the final boss. More substantial than the other chapters for sure, but still disconnected and somewhat unfinished. In Black Mesa, Interloper goes out of its way to flesh out these concepts, building on the narrative and gameplay established by the Nihilant's subjugation of the Vortigaunts, all the while linking back to previous Zen and Earthbound mechanics and carrying surprises of its own. It begins with you getting a good look at where you need to go, all the while Zen is bathed in a gloomy red aura. As you approach, you'll quickly recognize that the Vortigaunts are only hostile when their shackles glow, and when there are other species commanding them. Then you're met with a wall. You cannot proceed until this Vortigaunt takes pity on you, and decides to let you through. 
Here you can observe the Vort's lifestyle as slaves to the Nihilanth, and the Black Mesa team created entirely original architecture to give these Vorts a home. You also have a chance to defend them from an attack. And if you choose not to harm a single one throughout the chapter, even the ones that are attacking you while under mind control, you will get an achievement for your efforts. After this, you'll have to run like hell to escape not just one Gargantua, but several. They're everywhere. They took a simple little idea of a Gargantua smashing through a wall in the original game, and turned it into an adrenaline-pumping action set piece where you run for your life. You can even get an achievement for making it out of this chase without taking damage, and going for that makes the chase even more intense. Once you make it inside the tower, you'll notice that two major mechanics from the previous Zen chapters, the power cords and the things you have to shoot in order to proceed, both combine as you ascend the tower. While this progression and puzzle and level design is seamless and often really engaging, the ascent can get long and tedious. Like, I appreciate the cohesion they've been able to achieve in Zen's design, and Black Mesa's design as a whole, but there are so many moving parts in Interloper that they have you interact with, and I feel like they could have trimmed the fat of this chapter before releasing it. There's simply too much here, and as much as I love this game, I don't particularly enjoy replaying some of these sections, which is a huge detriment to the game's replayability as a whole. Having a bit of a slog toward the end of the game is not really an exciting prospect. When I first played Zen, I was okay with the length of Interloper because I had waited so long for the Zen chapters to be released. But after replaying it? Not so much. I don't mean to sound overly negative though, because it does genuinely have a great progression and ideas, culminating in a power trip where you have unlimited ammo for your gluon gun. Like the original game, the top of the tower has multiple conveyor belts and a slew of enemies hovering around you. You'd think that's where they'd end the chapter to keep it in line with the original Half-Life, but there's not only more puzzle solving and challenges to be faced, but there's also an entire final sequence where you disassemble the tower. I won't lie, they could have ended the chapter with a final power trip ascent and I would have been satisfied, and while these additions are fun in their own right, asking you to demonstrate a mastery of your movement and combat abilities, they are a little unnecessary and continue to inflate the chapter in size. At the very least, I think you could have cut the three-piece puzzle here altogether without impacting the pacing and design of the chapter at all. I'm only critiquing this chapter because I do really love this game as a whole, and I want it to be the best it can be. The Source Engine's accessibility as a modding platform, coupled with the Crowbar Collective's own desire to reimagine Half-Life to begin with, tells me that we will see multiple reinterpretations of Zen in the future. Black Mesa's Zen is merely one interpretation of what Zen could have been. To me, Black Mesa is not a replacement for the original Half-Life. If you prefer how Zen was portrayed in the original, or the level design and atmosphere of the original, you can still go back and revisit that game. None of Black Mesa is meant to replace Half-Life 1, as playing Half-Life 1 for yourself is required to fully appreciate what Black Mesa achieves. Black Mesa Zen is a phenomenal exploration of the aspects of Zen that were never fully explored. The stuff I could only dream about has finally been realized, and all the while it maintains and builds on the pivotal moments from the original Zen. It showcases that Zen is its own ecosystem under siege, and that in this war between our world and theirs, guilt falls on both sides. It is a beautiful thematic showcase of the ethical dilemmas that undercut Half-Life 1 as a game, and a fantastic summation of mechanics from across Black Mesa. Well worth the wait, and I applaud their efforts in finishing these chapters. There's just one thing left to do. As you approach the portal to the Nihilanth, you can hear echoes of your former colleagues. It's finally time to end things. Unlike the original game, the Nihilanth doesn't teleport you to random, disconnected areas while you fight it. Instead, this boss focuses primarily on precise movement and consistent gunfire as you shoot it until it dies. Aside from the realization that you need to destroy the crystals giving it power, the fight doesn't rely on anything other than pure, unfiltered combat, and after so much puzzle solving and interloper, I welcome that. It's a great final boss, and a perfect note to end the game on.
Black Mesa is a perfect showcase for something that I think remakes, spiritual successors, or any game inspired by something you love should learn. In developing these types of games, appreciating what made them incredible games is one thing, but it is more important to me to evaluate the mistakes they made and build games based on what could have been. People have been clamoring for a new Half-Life game for years, not just because they want to play Half-Life again, it's because there's still more to be done. There's still so much that this series is capable of. There's still paradigms to be explored. It's not about retreading the same ground, it's about doing what has yet to be done. Black Mesa understood this, and it understood this well. In reimagining Half-Life, they wanted to evaluate its flaws and build on what they felt Half-Life should have done. In doing this, Black Mesa created its own identity distinct from the original Half-Life. It does not replace the original work, it complements it. And that is what I think all art derived from passion for an original work should strive to do. The best part about Black Mesa, though? There's no gnome achievement this time. Finally, I'm free. Wait, what's this? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. So this script is a bit of a combination of both my original work on this video from 2021 when I initially announced it, as well as my current writing style, but the thesis is built from something that I've been thinking about a lot lately and it's something close to my heart when creating things, so it feels great to finally put this out into the world. I know some of you have been waiting a long time, both for me to return to Half-Life and for me to discuss this game, and I just want to thank you for your patience. Right now I want to give a couple of recommendations. A two-hour episode on Jacob Geller's podcast talking about the Resident Evil 4 remake, as well as a script Rasputin resurrected from 2013 talking about Kirby Air Ride. But you won't find these two on YouTube. Both are only on Nebula. I've been watching both Jacob Geller and Rasputin work with Nebula, and I finally had to get in on it myself. So I am happy to announce that I have joined Nebula, a platform built for and driven by creators. Nebula is home to not just ad-free videos from creators, but also early access to videos, as well as completely original and exclusive content for subscribers. Nebula is a fantastic way to support your favorite creators, as your support directly enables me to create better videos more often, as well as exclusive content just for you. All the while, you're receiving ad-free videos free of sponsor reads. For example, if you were watching this on Nebula, you wouldn't even be hearing me talk about this right now. Think about that. Also, by using the link in the description, you will gain access to classes on how to create videos directly from creators. Alex from Low Spec Gamer has a brilliant class on how to produce high quality content without breaking the bank. If you're an aspiring creator, I think these classes will be of great use to you. Nebula truly is an all-in-one creator-driven platform. If you sign up using the link below, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off an annual plan, which is as little as over $2.50 a month. I hope you'll consider checking it out. As always, I've been Liam Triforce. Thank you for watching.